Welcome to the intonation chapter. I'd like to deal a little bit with how to help students with intonation problems. Uh, <clears throat> some of these thoughts we've discussed in other chapters, but let me try to bring them together here. In a nutshell, playing tune on the saxophone comes down to two things, really. One, the ability to control pitch, and two, the ability to hear the pitch we're trying to play. Let me amplify that a little bit. How do I control pitch? The single most important coordination that a saxophonist can develop is the ability to change pitch without loosening the embouchure. There are many saxophone notes that are really grossly out of tune. And this comes to us because of the octave key compromise. We should have an octave key for all 12 notes. Uh, separate positioning of where that hole goes. We only have two octave keys, and so they're both very much a compromise. The first octave key found on the body of the saxophone services the notes from D up to A flat. So if you were a saxophone maker, where would you put that hole? Well, probably, like any good compromise, about for an F. Well, F's a good note. F sharp's not a bad note. When you get up to G and G sharp, they tend to crack really easily, especially on the larger horns. Uh, when you go down from F, E is a nice note, nice sounding note, but it's very sharp. E flat and D are not only sharp, but stuffy. So we've got some problems that come to those notes because of that compromise. Now, the upper compromise, uh, this, is the, this is the octave key on the neck. That services from A up to high F sharp or above. So now, when we get high enough, the, the compromise isn't that big a deal. It doesn't really affect it, things all that much. Although, like in a high B or high A, in the Altissimo chapter, we'll talk about dropping the third finger on a high B or high C, because it changes the octave key, and it turns out that the body octave key is better than the neck octave key for those notes, the placement of it. But uh, I would say that we're probably drilling that hole for around a D. The D is a pretty good note. When you go down to C sharp, it's bright and sharp, kind of like an E on the other, bottom of the other, uh, as we go down from the other compromise position on the other octave key. The, the C sharp is bright. The B tends to be quite bright too. But by the time we get down to the bottom on the A, it'll be not only sharp, but it'll be a little more stuffy. The more modern horns have helped this a bit. It's not as stuffy as it was, say, on the Mark VI. But uh, it's a stuffier note, like the D, because it's on the bottom of the octave key compromise. Uh, this might help to illustrate this. Let me play a D with the regular thumb octave key. Now let me play it. I'm going to put the D key, the high D palm key, down as the octave key. I'm substituting that for the thumb, so I'm not using the thumb. I'm still fingering 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, the regular D, adding the D key as an octave key. Now the problem with that is that that hole is way too big to be an octave key hole. It's too large. But the placement of it is probably a lot better position. The note's not stuffy. It's not nearly as sharp. A lot more controllable when you use the D key as an octave key than when you use the thumb key as an octave key. It's just drilled in the wrong place for a D. And this is what we're dealing with. Unfortunately, the audience doesn't know this and they don't care. They just expect us to deal with it and sound beautiful. So, there are notes that really are a problem on the saxophone, and it comes to us mostly because of that. Now, let's say I'm playing up to the D. Typically, it's going to come out very sharp like that for a young student. Well, if I loosen to get that down, still kind of sharp, and it's getting saggy, blatty. If I stay firm and I bring it down and sit with my tongue instead of my mouth, I can get it down where it belongs and still keep the tone. It's a pretty good note when I get it there, but I can't do it by loosening. Same with the A. Now if I go typically, it tends to come out about there. If I loosen, I'm not just loosening. I just want to loosen. I'm going to loosen.
use the tone on the note long before I find the pitch. But I stay firm, bring the notes down inside my oral cavity, bam, I've got tone. And I'm in tune. So this is really the big secret, first secret that we've got to deal with is I've got to develop the ability to control pitch without loosening my embouchure. Now the exercises in the warm-up that we dealt with in the basic section and are on the warm-up page are for this purpose. So if I play the matching exercise, for example, I'm going to play the F with the regular F fingering, and I'm going to play it with the low B flat fingering, sharp. All right, what's your first thought about how to bring it down? Oh, lip it down. And that's not going to work. I've got to keep focus to keep it up there. I'm going to bring it down inside the oral cavity, tongue positioning. Where I'm matching the regular pitch to uh, the overtone pitch to the regular pitch. I'm doing that internally. I'm not doing that here. So I've got to develop that ability. Now that ability is also developed with the flexibility exercise on the warm-up page. I can only do that if I don't loosen. If I loosen, I can't get anywhere. I demonstrated this back in the basics chapter, but here's a review of it. If I can keep my embouchure firm, and do that inside, that's going to give me the ability to keep my embouchure focused for the tone and bring the pitch down where it belongs without sacrificing the tone. This is huge on the saxophone. So I first I've got to develop that ability. The other thing, the other capacity I've got to develop is the ability to control pitch versus the dynamic level. Because when we go louder, we tend to get flatter. When we tend to, when we go sh uh, softer, we tend to go sharper. Uh, I illustrated these things in the intonation chapter, and you can go there for that uh, video demonstration as well. Uh, we use long tones with swells. Also, that that uh, I demonstrated that in the other chapter, so I'll let you see that there. Uh, I'm I have a whole chapter where I'm dealing with that, so I'm not going to amplify that in this chapter. But we have got to deal also with the ability to regulate pitch as we change dynamic level. And that's a function of oral cavity and embouchure working together with our breath support. Once I've uh, gotten the ability f to actually control where the pitch sits, then I simply have to hear where I need it to sit. And this is what I call pre-hearing the note. When I'm playing this, can you hear the top note? Ba, ba. I'm going to play it where I hear it. So if I'm hearing it, ba, da, I'm going to play it sharp. I have to hear it in the right place. Well, how do I work on that? <clears throat> I'm going to work on that uh, matching pitches with the piano, uh, learning how to sing intervals. I've got to learn to hear that sound in my ear. How do we learn to pre-hear notes? How do we develop our ears so that we're hearing the correct pitches internally? When I was coming up, I was pretty poor. I didn't even have a tuner. So I used to use the piano in the practice rooms, and I would do this. And that ring is a little discordant. A little stronger ring. Really discordant, hardly any power any there. Better, but it's still a little discordant. There, that's full strength and, and, and it sounds like it's in tune with itself. Hopefully you can hear that ring. So the strings are vibrating sympathetically to what I'm playing. So I can check pitches fairly quickly. It's like a big chromatic tuner in a way. 
Let's say I'm playing something. I don't know what is it. I want to check the C sharp because it's usually sharp. Really discordant now. I think I need to push in a little bit. I know I'm tuned a little bit low, but I I can't grab this, push that in easily without taking the read off, putting it back on. So I know I'm a little on the underside. Get the pedal. Pretty good. Better. I, I deliberately held it up because I knew I was a little flat. I held it too too high. So I would use the piano this way a lot when I was practicing. I could check pitches very quickly and see if I was starting to hear things where I thought it, what, where I thought they should be heard. I think it also helps to sing ahead of time. If you're singing a melody, I should be able to hear that note just before I play it, which I did, of course. Should be able to hear right where that sits. If I'm hearing it off, that's where I got to work. I've got to work on tuning my ears a little bit. All right, I'm going to move back over to the other position. I kind of mentioned this at the piano, but perhaps I should make it more, uh, emphasize it more, that we have to sing to develop our ears. It's not about vocal quality or having somebody hear you and think you're a good singer. That's nothing to do with it. You've got to sing to develop your capacity to hear pitch. So I really encourage you to do that a lot. Now, some other things that we can use. Uh, of course, we can use a tuner. But when you look at, when you just use a tuner, it's kind of a, an eyeball exercise of trying to zero in on that uh, needle. We don't want to use it as an eyeball exercise. We want to use it as a as a way of correcting ourselves or uh, confirming that we're hearing right. So instead, I would turn on my tuner and then I would play and see if I've got, I, I would try to hear the right pitch. Then I would look at the tuner, got to keep playing, and see if the tuner agrees that I, I heard it where I, I, I felt like it was playing a good place. Does the tuner agree? A little flat. I'm a little flat in general. Better. So <clears throat> I can use a tuner, but I would use it more as a way of checking. I wouldn't just stare at it. I would use my ears, try to get where I think I'm doing the right thing, and then look and see if it's doing, if it, if it agrees or not. And it may confirm that I'm thinking right, or it may correct me that I'm not getting it yet. <laughs> um, I love working with smart music. This is a program that's made by the same people that make uh, Finale, the music notation program, makemusic.com. And smart music has got a tuner. Yes, it's an accompanimental program. It's very good in a lot of ways, but I think it's worth the price just for the tuner because you can set the tuner to play the pitch back at you. You have a little mic on your bell, so it hears you and it hears the pitch you're playing and immediately plays right back at you, the pitch uh, perfectly in tune so you get immediate feedback. Wow, that can really start to develop your sensitivity. I think of it like having a cow, on, cow in a pasture with an electrified fence. And every time that cow goes near the fence, zzz, zzz, pretty soon you don't go near that fence. Well, smart music's a little bit like that. Every time you play that E and it's really sharp, it's like, oh, no. Like having a shock collar or something. <coughs> it, uh, pretty soon you don't go there. You know that that's not where it is. <coughs> I think it helps to develop your sensitivity to that. Uh, the cork tuner, this tuner, for example, has the ability where I can set it to play pitch back at me. 
The problem is there's no way you could hear it over the saxophone. <clears throat> it has an output. I never felt like I could get it loud enough. I'm told the new, the new record tuner may be better at this. I think there still is one that will play the sound back, similar to what the smart music will do. It'll do the same kind of thing for you, which I think that is super valuable to have immediate feedback <clears throat> as you play. I got that idea years ago when I'd be in the recording studio and they'd put an eventide um, on me that would, it would be like a delay where I'm hearing myself right afterwards. I was like, oh man, I'm not in tune with that. Or I am. I thought, man, if I could practice with that all the time, that would help me so much with my intonation. Well, it turns out that if I use one of these kind of tuners or the smart music, <laughs> I really am uh, practicing with that all the time, in effect. Uh, so I think that uh, that's probably, those are some good ideas on that. There are a couple more ideas that I think are super valuable. All right, I've, I've put on my jazz mouthpiece and I'm going to play with the rhythm section. And I'm not going to try to improvise. I'm just going to sustain notes with the rhythm section, see if I can lock in, see if I can hear where those notes fit. Now, I could use a tuner to double check myself, but I'm not going to stare at the tuner. I'm going to work with hearing it. I think I've got it. Peek at the tuner for confirmation or correction. Now, uh, the tuner can't do that if it hears the rhythm section, so I'd have to put the rhythm section in the headphones and then have the tuner only hearing me. But then it could give me some good feedback. I'd want to calibrate the tuner to the play-along track to make sure that, uh, that I'm hearing the right, that I'm gauging to the right thing. So I'm gonna put this rhythm section on. Keep going. One, two, one, two, three, four. My F a little bit. Look at my E. Sharp a little bit. You have to shift a little bit. A lot of different things you can hold these notes a long time. Look at my A. Ah, I'm going to work on my B. Ah, not work on my B. I need to work on my C. C sharp now. My D sharp. Can kind of get moving on after a minute, but after I've kind of got my bearings on the pit. Intonation. <laughs> 
So I'm just using it as an intonation exercise. <laughs> kind of crazy, huh? I think another really good way to work on this is with a drone. I'm going to just go back to my classical mouthpiece for the drone, I think. Uh, I had a student that made these drones. I think you'll like these. They're made with organs, so they sustain really nicely. But let me show you how I might practice with a drone. So this is droning on a concert G. I guess that would be an E for me. I think of it as E minor or G major. Or... So I can hear uh, whether how I'm relating to the drone from no matter what note I play, even a half step away. C sharp. No. Yeah, okay, that'll stop. So you got the idea of uh, how I could just play with a drone and get a lot better feel for inter how intervals are working, how the intonation is locking in with that drone note. You could put the drone on the root of what you're working on, or you could also put it on the, uh, the dominant note, the fifth, uh, to practice with, uh, I think works great. And you could even try it on other notes. But working with a drone is also, I think, a, really, a, a very real life way of tuning because you're having to tune what's happening around you you're not focused on a tuning needle you're listening to how you relate now again you if you put the drone in headphones and then you listen the tuner can only hear you then you can check use the tuner as a cross check i have one other thing that i think i want to show you it's a little exercise that i developed that i call the blowing exercise and it's really kind of phenomenal what it does to help this. Uh, so I want to do that, but I'm going to move over to the piano again for that. So give me a minute here. Okay, we're at the piano now, and I'd like to illustrate what I call the blowing exercise. I'll have a young student just play a nursery rhyme tune. Let's say it's Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> This has a ton of hard notes in it. I got D's, sharp, stuffy. E's, sharp, not so stuffy. A's, oh my gosh, this is all bad notes. Which is probably about how it's gonna be played. It's okay, let's see if we can sing those pitches better in tune. And I'll push the student. Starting note. Ba, ba, and then maybe they're singing ba, ba, no, you're sharp. Ba, 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 can you hear the next note? Ba, and of course they're not going to hear it that well. Usually it's too narrow. It's like ba, 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 no, you got to come down more. Ba, da, ba, da, da, ba, da, ba, da. Can you hit the other note? Ba, da, there you go. Ba, da, 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 da. Can you hit this next note? Ba, no, not likely. It's like ba, ba, da, no, no, no. Or ba, da, da, no, no, no. Ba, can you hear it? Ba, I've got to get them to pre-hear those notes, and I have to work with them a little back and forth a little bit on this. One, after a little while, I've got them singing this fairly well in tune. Ba, da, da, no. ba, da, 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 
Once I can get that fairly locked in and tune in the mind, now I want him to blow it with the airstream. So we'll do it not too loud at first. And this is like kind of a half whistle, but purse the lips a little bit and I'm trying to get it in tune with blowing with the airstream. Again, trying to develop accuracy of pitch with where I'm blowing. I want them to blow the same velocity of air as we want the note to vibrate. All right, now, <clears throat> once we can kind of get that, then I have them blow it hard, loud, as take big breaths, blow as hard as you can. I tell them to, if I'm, if I'm over there, I say, part my hair. <laughs> but uh, I want them to blow loud, and this may mean, that may mean I need to breathe every two or three notes, but it's, it'll sound like something like this. Okay, let's see if we can go louder. I'm trying to get them to really blow the velocity of the very strong, but still at that pitch level, if at all possible. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to cause me to start hyperventilating. I'm already feeling a little bit lightheaded, <clears throat> and I don't want the kids to be laying on the floor. Parents call me, what are you doing over there? I, <clears throat> I want to be a little sensitive to that. So, all right, let's rest for a second. Let's recover the oxygen balance in our bloodstream. All right, this time we're going to blow really loud. But have your horn ready because right after we quit, and we won't go through the whole thing because you'll be hyperventilating by that time. Uh, if you're doing it right, I tell them if you're not hyperventilating, you're not doing it right. So we're gonna we're gonna go as, as far as we can. We'll go a little ways, and then we're gonna play it on the horn. Same thing we did before. All right, ready? Seriously, it's a magic trick every time I do this. Now, I may have to struggle with the student a little bit to get them to hear the, the pitch more accurately and then to blow the pitch more accurately. But once that happens, it is amazing what happens on the horn. We're now blowing the correct velocities for the sounds that we're trying, for the pitches we're trying to, to make. And so the horn is now centering. It's locking into a big sound on each note. The intonation is incredibly better. It's amazing. It's really like a magic trick. I use this with my whole ensemble, with the big band, and it's phenomenal what happens. When I have a shout chorus and I want some power and I have the students do the same thing, sing it, first, first of all, play it, so we have a barometer of what we're, where we were, then sing it, work on singing it intonation accurately, then blow it, now blow it really strong, now let's play, and we won't play all the way through so that we can have some stamina left, all right, play it, and it's like dumbfounding the difference in the power, but it's not just the power. The power is there because the notes are centering and they're in tune. It's not just because we're blowing harder. So that's an exercise that you could use. I, I've done it with students, for example, where I say, all right, do this with three different nursery rhymes for the first five minutes, then practice for a half hour, then do it again for five minutes, and then practice for the, the rest of the time. This is a young student, maybe this, but it's amazing uh, what happens over a short period of time once it starts uh, working. So I would really recommend it as a possible exercise uh, to work with your students on intonation and tone. It helps the tone, as you heard. It helps the tone and the intonation. So uh, there are a number of other ideas in the book. I'm not doing everything that's in the book. I'm doing the things that I think need a, an oral demonstration so you can hear them. I've got a number of tuning fingerings in the book that you can check out, certain fingerings that we might use to help notes play better in tune in certain circumstances, and there's stuff that you need to read on that, so I, I won't bring that up, but 
uh, please do check out the saxophone, my saxophone pedagogy book, the Lace Mesa saxophone pedagogy book. It is available on Amazon and other places. And read the stuff that's coordinated to these videos. It's really the other way around. The videos are coordinated to what you're going to read so that you can hear the demonstrations of some of the things that I have expressed there in writing. So uh, those are a few thoughts on uh, helping a student work on intonation.